SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently claimed that future Starship prototypes would have a higher payload capacity than the current version. As per the SpaceX website, Starship is currently capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons in a fully reusable configuration and 250 metric tons in an expendable configuration. According to Musk, future Starships will be able to lift 250 to 300 tons into orbit in an expendable mode, thanks to the improved thrust and specific impulse of Raptor engines. Earlier this month, Musk revealed that the next generation of the Raptor engines, dubbed Raptor V3, reached a new thrust record on a tripod test stand at SpaceX's McGregor test facility. The engine achieved 2.64 MN, or 269 tons of thrust, operating consistently at a chamber pressure of 350 bar for more than 50 seconds. With 33 Raptor 3 engines, future Super Heavy prototypes will produce a total thrust of 87.12 MN, or 8,877 tons, making the Starship the most powerful rocket in history. Moreover, with 300 tons of payload capacity, the combined Starship and Super Heavy vehicle will have a lift-off mass of 6,000 tons. Repairs following the maiden Starship flight and preparations ahead of the second launch are ongoing at Starbase. After lots of cutting and grindings, teams removed the booster quick disconnect mechanism shielding on May 21. A few hours later, the flex hoses that supply propellants to the booster were removed from the launch mount. The Starship quick disconnect mechanism that allows the flow of propellants, gases, electric power, and communication signals to the ship was also removed from the orbital launch tower the same day. The ship quick disconnect was later moved to the build site for inspections and repairs. It looks like SpaceX is planning to refurbish and upgrade both the booster and Starship quick disconnect mechanisms before the next integrated test flight. SpaceX is currently installing water-cooled steel plates under the launch mount to protect the launch pad from damage during future Starship launches. Pressurized water will flow through the channels inside the steel plates before being discharged under the launch mount like a shower head. The water released will cool the metal surface and simultaneously absorb energy from the booster engine plume during liftoff. At the production site, teams have already started pre-assembling the steel plates on the water supply pipes and manifolds. In order to force water at the required pressure under the launch mount, SpaceX needs several high-pressure gas canisters that can store gas at very high pressure. The launch site already received a few high-pressure canisters, and more such high-pressure storage tanks have recently been delivered there. They have the capacity to hold gas at pressures of 200 to 400 bar. Please check out my previous videos for a detailed explanation of how the steel plate water distribution system will operate, links in the description. Some of the vertical propellant storage tanks at the launch site were damaged by debris kicked off during last month's Starship orbital test flight. According to Musk, vertical tanks will be replaced by horizontal tanks in the near future to avoid accidents during Starship launches. Two horizontal storage tanks are already en route to Starbase and will be used to store cryogenic liquid oxygen required for future missions. Teams have already begun the construction of the foundation for those horizontal tanks over the suborbital landing pad where the Starship prototypes attempted to land during the high-altitude test flights. Starship 25, which arrived at the launch site on May 18 for static fire testing, is being prepared for the test on suborbital launch pad B. According to SpaceX, they will directly attempt a six-engine static fire test on Ship 25. During a recent flyover, at the build site, RGV aerial photography spotted components that are believed to be the parts of a Starship lunar lander. With the help of these tweets posted by the space engineer, let's learn more about the human landing system components spotted. The components spotted at the Starbase production site are the forward dome adapter, the elevator assembly, and the support floor for the crew compartment. This animation will demonstrate how the components will be assembled. The floor of the crew compartment will be placed on top of the forward dome assembly, and the elevator used to transfer astronauts to the lunar surface will be placed on top of the floor. It's currently unclear whether the parts spotted are for a fully operational lunar starship or for a full-scale mock-up. In a recent interview at the Human to Mars conference, Nick Cunnings, director of advanced development for civil space at SpaceX, revealed some details on the crew deck and airlock of the human landing system. And the crew deck of the Starship Lunar Lander is about twice the size of this stage. Um, and there are room, there's room in Starship for multiple crew decks. Um, below that crew deck, there are two airlocks um, that are each about the, the pressurized volume of a Dragon capsule. And then those airlocks are inside a very large garage, which is, again, about the size of double the size of the stage. Super Heavy Booster 11's methane tank was fully stacked inside the megabay on May 20th. 
teams installed all four booster grid fins on the methane tank three days later. The primary structure of booster 11 will be complete when the methane tank section is stacked atop the already completed oxygen tank section. As production ramps up, SpaceX is looking for a new location to build and store new ships and boosters. A new mega bay is under construction north of the existing mega bay, and its sections are being prefabricated near the propellant production site. Elon Musk confirmed that in the future, along with all the production tents, the low bay, the old production building, and the ground fabrication building, will be replaced by the Star Factory, which is currently under construction. This image edited by Niall Anderson will give us an idea of how the production site will look once the Star Factory is complete. SpaceX is currently building the foundation for a booster test stand at the Massey's test site. The company has already begun conducting Starship and test tank cryoproof tests at Massey's. Once the site is ready for booster tests all future super heavy cryoproof tests will be conducted here. According to media reports, SpaceX is joining the US Federal Aviation Administration to fight a lawsuit filed by environmental organizations. The lawsuit, which was filed on May 1, claims that before approving SpaceX's application for a launch license for the test flight on April 20, the FAA failed to properly assess the damage that the giant Starship rocket could cause to the environmentally sensitive lands and endangered species habitat surrounding the launch site. The lawsuit seeks the FAA to conduct an environmental impact statement, a lengthy and thorough procedure that would likely sideline Starship work in Texas for years. Consequently, SpaceX filed a motion on May 19 in court, requesting a federal judge to allow it to join the FAA as a co-defendant in the ongoing lawsuit. If the court were to rule in the plaintiff's favor, further licensing of the Starship program could be significantly delayed, seriously impacting SpaceX's operations at Starbase. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Four commercial space flyers who launched on Axiom's second private astronaut mission arrived at the International Space Station on May 22 to begin their eight-day-long stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket carrying the four-person AX-2 crew lifted from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A on Sunday, May 21. Following a successful staging, the launch vehicle's first stage performed a boost back burn to return to SpaceX's landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The booster touched down safely at the site about 7 minutes and 45 seconds after launch. AX-2's SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, named Freedom, separated from the rocket's upper stage about 12 minutes after liftoff and began its journey toward the International Space Station as planned. AX-2 is commanded by Peggy Whitson, a former NASA astronaut who is currently Director of Human Space Flight at Axiom. Whitson, who holds a PhD in biochemistry, has flown three missions to the International Space Station in the past and has spent 665 days in space. She commanded the orbiting complex twice and completed 10 spacewalks. Aviator John Schaffner, who has more than 8,500 flight hours in various commercial aircraft and helicopters, serves as the AX-2 mission pilot. AX-2 mission specialists Ali Al-Karni and Rihanna Barnawi are two Saudi astronauts the Saudi Space Commission selected to fly on the mission. Al Karni is a fighter pilot with nearly 2,400 hours of flight experience. Barnawi has several degrees in biomedical sciences, and her work on AX-2 will concentrate on breast cancer and stem cell research. The cost per seat on the AX-2 mission has yet to be disclosed, but NASA has previously said that a SpaceX crew launch costs about $55 million per seat, so the price for these private missions is expected to be high. Following a nearly 15-hour journey, the AX-2 crew docked at the International Space Station's Harmony module. Hatches between their spacecraft and the ISS opened more than an hour later, and the astronauts entered the space station. The four AX-2 astronauts joined the seven-person team already on the station as part of the Expedition 69 mission. The AX-2 crew has a busy schedule of more than 20 research experiments, technology demonstrations, and in-space outreach events for students and the Saudi public. The Dragon spacecraft carrying the AX-2 astronauts is scheduled to undock from the space station on May 30 and will then descend through Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Florida. Axiom plans a third private astronaut mission to the space station late this year on a Falcon 9 rocket, but the company has not yet disclosed the crew for the mission. After nearly two years of maintenance and upgrade works, Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 suborbital vehicle aced its fifth test flight to suborbital space on May 25. Mothership aircraft, VMS Eve, took off from the runway at Spaceport America in New Mexico on Thursday morning, carrying spaceplane VSS Unity. The mission, called Unity 25, represents the company's fifth and final test flight before commencing commercial operations. 
The mission was commanded by Mike Masucci with CJ Sterko as pilot. Four company employees flew as mission specialists on the vehicle to test the flight experience ahead of commercial flights. After takeoff, BMS Eve climbed to an altitude of approximately 14.3 kilometers before releasing VSS Unity. Shortly after the release, VSS Unity ignited its hybrid rocket engine for around 60 seconds, taking it to an altitude of over 87 kilometers, which is above the 80 kilometers altitude used by U.S. government agencies for awarding astronaut wings. Unity spent about five minutes at that altitude, and the passengers experienced a few minutes of weightlessness and saw Earth against the blackness of space. The spaceship came back to Earth few minutes later, touching down on a runway at Spaceport America, officially bringing an end to the Unity 25 mission. The mission took 90 minutes in total. Virgin Galactic's next flight will start the company's commercial research service with the long-delayed Italian Air Force flight. This flight, known as Galactic 01, is currently scheduled for late June. Regular commercial space flights are expected to start afterward. The company aims to fly roughly once per month once commercial operations begin. A ticket to ride with Virgin Galactic currently costs $450,000, and hundreds of people have booked a seat to date. South Korea's domestically made Nuri rocket, also known as KSLV-2, delivered a commercial-grade satellite into orbit on May 25. The 47.2-meter-tall Nuri rocket lifted off from Narrow Space Center on the southern coast of South Korea on Thursday evening in its third mission. It was the first operational flight of the Nuri vehicle, carrying the 180 kilograms next Sat-2, an X-band synthetic aperture radar technology demonstrator, along with seven CubeSats. Payload separation began just 13 minutes into the flight, and all eight satellites were deployed into a sun-synchronous low-Earth orbit within two minutes. Please check out the link in the description to learn about the payloads in detail. The Nuri rocket, capable of lifting 1,500 kg to a sun-synchronous orbit, is fitted with six liquid-fueled engines. The rocket's first stage consists of four KRE-075 engines, which combine to produce 2,942 kN of thrust at sea level. The second and third stages are powered by single vacuum optimized engines. All six engines use jet fuel and liquid oxygen as propellants. South Korea first tried to launch a 1,500 kg dummy satellite with the Nuri rocket in October 2021. The attempt failed when the rocket's third stage engine shut down prematurely and the satellite failed to reach low Earth orbit. The vehicle's second flight, in June last year, went much more smoothly. Nuri carried a 1,300 kg dummy satellite payload, four CubeSats, and a 180 kg performance verification satellite into a circular 700 km high sun-synchronous polar orbit. The next flight of Nuri is expected in 2024, and the launch cadence of the rocket is expected to be one flight per year after that. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.